In January 2022, a man dressed in a bucket-style hat, sunglasses, and two scarves entered an independent healthcare clinic in Waipahu, Hawaii. 48 seconds later, the man left. 47-year-old John Tokuhara would be found dead inside. Despite what should have been a wealth of evidence, security cameras, shell casings left at the scene, even the hat that the assailant wore left behind, this is a case that seemed to prove only one thing, that things were more complicated than they appeared. Proving the identity of this killer would be a difficult, nearly impossible task. Hi there, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. Today we're taking a look at a lesser known but fascinating case out of Hawaii. This is the story of an investigation and prosecution that caught many people by surprise. It developed from a straightforward case. All signs seemed to point in the same direction. But then as more details came to light, new evidence emerged, existing evidence was questioned, and the picture of what really happened became far less clear. Let's take a look. The town of Waipahu is in Honolulu County, Hawaii. It is located along the northern shore of both Middle Lock and West Lock of Pearl Harbor. Once the location of a sugarcane plantation, the town on the island of Oahu is now home to about 40,000 residents. It's a short drive to the picturesque Eva Beach. The morning of Thursday, January 13th, 2022 was warm with clear skies in Waipahu. Around 8 a.m. that morning, Lily Tokuhara took a drive out to check on her son, John. 47-year-old John Tokuhara had owned and operated a healthcare business in Waipahu for nearly 20 years. The previous evening, John had told his mother that he planned to drop by and pick up some dinner that she had made him, but John never turned up. When Lily arrived at the acupuncture and healthcare clinic, she saw her son's white Tacoma pickup truck parked near to the doorway. She entered the office through the back door, which was unlocked. The front door, which faced Waipahu Depot Street, had not been in use for at least six months. It had been secured with a chain. Inside, Lily spotted her son. John was lying on the floor of his office, a pool of blood by his head. He was unresponsive. A call was placed to emergency services immediately, though the distraught mother found it too difficult to attempt medical aid. It was far too late. Officer John Mintern of the Honolulu Police Department was the first to arrive on scene. He found one spent shell casing on the office floor, a 22 caliber. Later, two additional casings were also located, one underneath John Tokuhara and another behind the refrigerator. John's autopsy later determined that his cause of death was a gunshot to the head. He had in fact been shot no less than four times. It was a brutally efficient and heartless killing. Multiple headshots delivered to the face suggested a crime of passion. Furthermore, a significant amount of cash was located near to John in his office, approximately $4,000 in large bills. If the murderer had been aware of the money, they had clearly not been interested in it. The murder appeared personal, yet the method quick and callous. John Tokuhara was unmarried. He did not have any children. He did, however, have a very close-knit family and loving, longtime friends. He was particularly close with his mother, Lily, and was a loving uncle to his sister's two boys. John had loved everything involving the ocean, including fishing, surfing, and paddling. After earning a master's degree in Chinese medicine and acupuncture, he had opened and independently ran the Tokuhara Acupuncture and Healthcare Clinic. Friends spoke of him adoringly. A staple in Waipahu for nearly 20 years, John's murder came as a horrible shock to the entire community. This tragedy has really brought the community together, I think, in Waipahu. Um, and so, you know, the community, our friends, you know, everybody has just rallied together and shown so much support for the family. 
You know, he's an acupuncturist, and so he's a healer, um, you know, and he's helped so many people in the community. He had friends in so many different circles, and he was just someone that was just loved. He gave back to his community, um, gave scholarship. He's all about the people. He's all about the com community. And you guys, he just stripped that away. But they ain't going to take the love we have for him or the love he had for us away. God bless us all. It took some time for investigators to put together all the pieces of John Tokuhara's life. No potential suspects emerged after speaking with friends and family. John had been widely admired. No one could point to a motive. Investigators began constructing a timeline from the night before John was found, tracing his last communications and movement. Two cell phones, both of which belonged to John, were located on the desk in his office. One of these devices was not in service and seemed to only function when connected to Wi-Fi. Investigators were told that the Wi-Fi only phone was only used to play the game Pokemon Go. That is exactly what John appeared to be doing the night before. The application was opened on his Wi-Fi phone at about 5.40 p.m. and never closed. The phone powered off at 8.45. The battery had depleted. Whether John was actively engaged with the game for three hours or was killed while he played was uncertain. After speaking with John's mother, Lily, detectives learned that she had last been in contact with her son at just after 6 p.m. He had sent her a text from his main device making the arrangements to collect dinner. He did not, as we know, arrive as planned. There was no further activity on that device after 6.18 p.m. With this time frame in mind, security camera footage from the area surrounding the acupuncture clinic was collected to see if anything or anyone suspicious had been captured. At about three minutes before six o'clock, a white four-door Silverado pickup truck with Hawaii plates was captured turning north onto Waipahu Depot Street from Farrington Highway. After a handful of quick turns in the area, the truck passed the intersection a few streets over from the clinic and escaped from view. However, from the next junction over, an individual emerged moments later and continued on foot towards Waipahu Depot Street, approaching the acupuncture clinic from the back. The person is wearing a light-colored bucket-style hat, dark-colored sunglasses, as well as a head covering and scarf. They carried a brown shopping bag. The person entered John's office at about 6.16 p.m., roughly the same time that the last activity was noted on John's main cell phone. Only 48 seconds later, the same individual was shown leaving. No one else was spotted entering or leaving the building until Lily arrived the next morning at 8 a.m. As the white Silverado drove past the businesses on Waipahu Depot Street, the front license plate was visible. A still photograph taken from the video surveillance, enhanced and examined by law enforcement, seemed to show that the first three characters in the license plate appeared to be letters, and the last three characters appeared to be numerals. An exact read of the plate was impossible. There did not appear to be any distinguishing marks on the Silverado. There are no items visible in the truck bed, but the vehicle was nonetheless the best available lead. The HPD's strategic enforcement detail found 53 Silverado pickup trucks registered in the state that matched the information they had. Four doors, white in color, likely a 2014 to 2016 model, and a license plate that they believed had three letters followed by three numbers. Investigators claimed that they were then able to exclude 52 of the 53 vehicles on their list. According to police records, detectives did so systematically. They requested photographs, visited and viewed the trucks in person, as well as considered the location of their ownership. Process of elimination left only one possibility as a match to the one captured on the security footage. The final remaining Silverado was registered to a 34-year-old ex-client of John's, a man named Eric Thompson. Eric, who ran his own successful contracting business, had seen John for treatment of carpal tunnel some years earlier. It was a connection between the two, but that was all. 
Eric, married to his high school sweetheart and a loving father to their three-year-old daughter, was not exactly a likely suspect. What motive would the young contractor have had to murder a man that had treated his pain years before? When detectives sifted through the correspondence on John's main cell phone, they found thousands of messages, over 5,600 in one month alone, with a woman named Joyce. Joyce Thompson. The messages between Joyce and John were extremely intimate. The two exchanged nude photos, videos, and explicit messages. The romantic relationship appeared to have gone on for some time, but had ended abruptly nearly seven months prior to John's death, when Joyce's husband, Eric, found out about their relationship. Based on their exchanges, it seemed that John had been far more committed to the relationship than Joyce from the start. He had been the first one to say, I love you, and continued to express his feelings frequently. Over a period spanning from mid-May to late July 2021, John pressed Joyce to transition their relationship from an affair to a longer-term commitment. For her part, Joyce was certainly a willing participant, but she expressed some concern. She told John that she would continue to see him, but that she would not leave her husband. Eventually, Joyce grew worried over the secrecy of their affair and the detriment it could have to her marriage. In July, she messaged John about Eric's discovery of their affair. Eric confronted his wife over a late night trip from the house she made while he was away for work. He had spotted her on their home security cameras, sneaking out of the house at 1 a.m. Confessing to the entire affair, Joyce agreed to end things with John, and she and Eric decided to take steps to salvage their marriage. Joyce and Eric Thompson met at Kalani High School in East Honolulu and were married on January 14th, 2017, the day of their 13th anniversary. The ceremony was held at a neighbor's beachfront estate and attended by a large gathering of family and friends. The young couple made a move to Kailua, a roughly 30-minute drive from Waipahu. Together, they had shared major milestones. Eric's graduation from the University of Hawaii and the birth of their only child, a daughter, two years before John's murder. From a distance, the couple's marriage and their family life appeared nearly perfect. Indeed, it was the couple's desire to have a baby that led Joyce to seek John's services. An old high school teacher had introduced Eric and Joyce to John and suggested he could help them. Joyce initially began seeing him for treatment for both fertility and back pain. Following a heartbreaking miscarriage, the couple was trying everything they could to get pregnant. At that time, Eric believed that John Tokuhara was helping them both. Indeed, he had been. Though after the birth of their daughter, Joyce's appointments continued. And her relationship with John, it seems, grew into something more. With these revelations coming to light, both Joyce and Eric became persons of interest. Um, on 1-13-2022, we initiated a murder investigation for the victim, John Tokuhara. During the course of this ongoing investigation for approximately three weeks, we have determined that there is a link between the victim and the suspect and that this was not a random act. We have discovered that the victim was in a romantic relationship with a female. We now consider this female and another male to be persons of interest. Search warrants have been executed on their residence, vehicle, and person. Both persons of interest have been uncooperative and retained attorneys. Eric Thompson left his house in his white 2014 Silverado at about 5.20 p.m. on the evening of John's murder. The truck drove in the direction of the highway. There are not enough cameras along the route from the Thompson's house in Kailua to the acupuncture clinic in Waipahu to create an unbroken trail of Eric's movements. If this was, in fact, his Silverado that was spotted on the depot street at around 6 p.m., though the drive time aligns almost Exactly. Data on Google Maps showed that it would take a vehicle between 35 to 55 minutes, depending on traffic, 
to reach the area of the clinic from the entrance of the highway if they departed at 5.20 p.m. The Chevrolet Silverado is first seen on video surveillance in the Waipahu area at 5.57 p.m., which is 37 minutes after Eric is seen leaving his driveway. Neighbors' cameras showed Eric pulling back into his driveway at 6.47. After returning home, detectives believed that Eric took steps to destroy any evidence of the crime he had just committed. Less than an hour later, the same camera captured lights from a fire in the back of the Thompson's property. The glow of the fire in his backyard lasted about five minutes. He also left the house once more that night. On that second trip, there is an item visible in the bed of the pickup truck that was not there earlier that night a cross box, usually used to store tools. The box was still visible when Eric returned again, roughly an hour later, at 10.43. A search of the Thompson home found little to directly link either Eric or Joyce to the murder. But where direct evidence was lacking, there was an expanding pile of circumstantial clues that couldn't be ignored. A bucket in the backyard sitting inside a wheelbarrow both showed burn marks, signs that items had recently been set aflame. In the house, the HPD collected 12 registered firearms, all belonging to Eric Thompson. They also found two additional guns. These were unregistered. Of Eric's collection, two guns matched the models that had already been determined as the likely murder weapon, 22 caliber rifles. However, testing found that none of these firearms were a match, leading to further speculation as to what could have been in the back of Eric's pickup on his second drive from the house. What they did find were over a thousand rounds of 22 caliber bullets. There was one final piece of evidence that threatened to either solidify the case against Eric Thompson or destroy it. The light-colored bucket hat worn by the assumed gunman as he entered and exited the clinic. As the shooter crossed Waipahu Depot Street after leaving the clinic, the bucket-style hat is captured falling to the ground. It was left behind by the assailant. The hat sat on the street for 10 minutes or so before a pedestrian spotted it and took it with them. The pedestrian who collected the hat was eventually located. A homeless man, who briefly wore the hat himself until reaching his campsite, where he hung the hat up in his tent and never wore it again. After processing the hat, technicians found fibers and a hair. These were processed alongside two samples swabbed from the inside of the hat on the rim and the crown. The results were not exactly damning. Eric Thompson could not be excluded as the source of the DNA. On Valentine's Day 2022, Eric Thompson was arrested and charged with second-degree murder and carrying or use of a firearm in the commission of a separate felony. He posted a $1 million bond and prepared for trial. Mr. Thompson will be entering a plea of not guilty, and we will be proceeding to trial in this case. When the trial commenced in July 2023, the state's arguments focused heavily on the motive. Joyce's affair with John, and the nature of the murder itself, four gunshots to the head, being a personal, anger-fueled attack. They painted a picture of the perfect life and marriage that Eric thought he once had, calling the 34-year-old a controlling perfectionist. Eric worked hard to start a successful business and save for a down payment on a $2 million home. When he found out about his wife Joyce's affair with John Tokuhara, he made her confess to her parents and apologize for the affair. Over 5,600 DMs, direct messages, between John and one of his former clients, Joyce Thompson. And these messages are important because they were very sexual and intimate in nature, including nude photographs and videos. And the messages revealed that Eric found out about the affair not once, not twice, not three times, but four times to the face. This was personal. To finally get back to that perfect life, 
he would have to end the life of the man who threatened it all. And as long as John remained alive, Eric's, Eric Thompson's life would remain imperfect. So he made a plan to finally fix it. That the defendant tried to play how to get away with murder. But he failed. He failed because of the relentless pursuit of HPD watching weeks worth of video surveillance. When it came time for Eric's defense to present their arguments, a case that had seemed so clear cut was thrown into disarray. And along with it, the unfailingly positive image of John Tokuhara. It seems that his affair with Joyce Thompson was not the first that John had with another man's wife or partner, not even close. The defense lined up witnesses to testify to the acupuncturist's previous relationships, which had been the cause of at least one other divorce. His personal life was not the only source of controversy. Alongside text messages on John's phone detailing his romances were indications that he was involved in illegal gambling. According to Eric's defense team, the $4,000 in large bills found at the murder scene and John's betting activities were never properly investigated. You will hear evidence that John Tokuhara had a track record of cheating with being come, becoming involved with women who were in relationships, 2,500 messages with another woman, okay? We didn't follow up on that one, okay? We didn't follow up on the woman, he, the messages he ghosted. We didn't follow up on the gambling post. The detectives told witnesses specifically, oh, John was not involved in any gambling. Well, he had a secret life. Eric did not kill John Tokuhara, and there will not be any evidence of it. Uh, I strike that. There will be massive reasonable doubt. John DeMarco told the jury how his ex-wife began an affair with John that led to the dissolution of his marriage. His wife had also been one of John's acupuncture patients. He testified that he has since moved on, remarried, and held no ill will towards John. Indeed, the acupuncturist became like a father figure to their daughter before eventually splitting with DeMarco's ex-wife. Said kind of like good riddance, you know, I was, he, he could have her and I wanted to just focus on my kid's life and myself, so. While the prosecution maintained that only Eric Thompson had a motive for murder, the defense countered with witnesses that ostensibly would hold an identical motive. Daryl Fujita, whose relationship had also ended as a result of an affair with John, was also called to testify. Police had explored Daryl as a person of interest, but eventually determined he had a tight alibi and there was no evidence linking him to the murder. But he did admit to deleting data from his cell phone before talking to police. He expressed his frustration to have been pulled into the investigation at all. I mean, I understand why. I think it's ridiculous, but I understand why, yes. Well, how do you feel about it? I mean, it's not cool because literally I have nothing to do with this. Both John DeMarco and Daryl Fujita testified that they had nothing to do with the murder and that they had no reason to want John dead. Each laid the blame for their failed relationships with their ex-partners, not John. After initial bouts of hurt and anger, each placed the experience behind them and moved on. When Eric Thompson took the stand, he testified that after discovering Joyce's affair, he reacted in exactly the same manner. Eric explained how he and Joyce had approached John with their fertility issues. He had been a help to them both during that time. Eric was dumbfounded when he discovered the affair. After viewing the security tape of his wife sneaking out at night, he could find no innocent explanation. I was kind of scratching my head, like, like, what, what, why would, why would, what, like, where are you going and, like, where's our daughter? I was pissed. Um, I was really disappointed. Um, it, I mean, it just didn't make sense that, like, John helped us through the pregnancy and, like, I mean, what, I just didn't understand what, why he would do that if he's just gonna uh, uh, blow it up later. The first couple of days I was thinking, you know, call him, chew him out. But it came to the realization that 
you know, I don't think I could have said anything to make things better. And I, I don't think I could get him to say sorry or feel bad. I mean, what's, what's the point? You know, like, I mean, he, I think he obviously didn't care about what I thought or, or like, or my family. So, I mean, I, I just realized that th there's just no point. Joyce agreed to stop seeing John. He worked on trying to forgive her, and over the following months, he said, they were almost back to the same happy place they had been prior to the affair. I, mean, I, I think she was truly sorry for it. Um, she made the effort, she, you know, sh um, she never talked talk, talk to John again. I, I came to the realization that, you know, the, the, the problem was with me and Joyce. It, it wasn't I mean, she cut him off and he was, he was, he was a non-factor after that. I realized I was kind of neg neglecting her. So sometimes she, um, uh, yeah, I think I, I was taking her for granted. Sometimes. Eric denied that the Silverado captured driving around Waipahu that night was his, and he flatly denied killing John Tokuhara. On the right side, uh, you heard the testimony in this case that that's a screenshot from a surveillance video of a white truck in Waipahu, correct? Correct. Is that your truck? No. Okay. Period. Is that your license plate? Well, were you in any time in Waipahu on January 12th, 2022? No. January 12th, 2022 or January 13th, 2022, did you kill John Tokuhara? No, I didn't. During cross-examination, Eric's seeming acceptance of the betrayal was scrutinized. He was asked what details he knew of their intimacy. Did his wife say, I love you? Did he ever access her phone and view any of the thousands of messages, photos, or videos shared between them? So she did tell you that she said, I love you to John Tokuhara? Uh, she said, yeah, at some points, yeah, they, they were, they, yeah. I've seen photos on Joyce's phone, baby photos, family photos. After discovering the affair, you never looked at her messages between her and John Tokuhara? No. You never saw photos on the phone, on Joyce's phone? Correct. You never saw videos on Joyce's phone? Correct, there were no videos. There were no videos? I didn't see any videos on her phone because you never looked on her phone. Correct, I never looked at her phone. After the affair ended, Eric testified that the trust in their marriage had been restored. 11 days before the murder, they entered into a post-marital agreement, which stated that Eric would get the house and sole custody of their daughter if they divorced. The prosecutor alleged that Eric made his wife sign the agreement. The defense countered that it was Joyce's idea to prove to her husband that she would not be unfaithful ever again. She knew that I was never going to leave her, and she knew that she was never going to cheat again, so she said, hey, look, I'll prove it to you. But then problems emerged in the marriage again. Eric had insisted that Joyce stop seeing psychics after one had supported her choice to have the affair. Eric depicted Joyce's affinity for psychic readings as similar to a substance addiction like alcoholism. Do you believe that's a fair example of an alcoholic who relapses and drinks when you talk about Joyce and psychics? Yeah, I'm not sure if there's a name for, for that condition or just an obsession, but yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a slippery slope. After the affair, she agreed to stop receiving readings, but in December of that year, a month before John's murder, Joyce again reached out to a psychic. The prosecution alleged this was a breach in trust that showed the marriage had not healed as Eric claimed. It was also an example of how he continued to try to control his wife. She was done with psychics and then I kind of find out that she, she was seeking another one. So you still didn't trust your wife in December of 2021? Um, d during that psychic incident, yes. Eric also testified to his movements on the night in question, accounting for the footage capturing his truck leaving the driveway at 5.20 p.m. and then again at just before 10. He testified that on the first trip, 
he was dumping construction materials, a small load of bricks, at the Waimanalo Convenience Center. The second trip was to the shop to purchase a handful of food items. He paid in cash. There was no video surveillance, receipts, transactions, or witnesses who could verify Eric's alibi. In fact, the prosecution called Rocky Javier, a security guard at the dump. Rocky was working on that night and testified that he's never seen Eric Thompson before. He added that the bricks Eric says he dumped would not be allowed at the site. They were prohibited items. Nonetheless, he doesn't keep track of every person that comes through or inspect every load. It is not possible to be that thorough when the site is busy. Footage of Eric Silverado also shows an empty truck bed when leaving the drive at 520. There are no bricks visible. Of the flames emanating from his backyard for a span of five minutes that night, Eric said these were caused by tiki torches. He often lights these in the back when he takes his daughter outside to play in the evenings. The defense called its own fire expert who testified that the flames captured in the neighbor's camera could very well have been from tiki torches. Eric explained that he used the bucket and wheelbarrow to melt metal for work projects. It was not only the video footage that was called into question. A defense DNA expert testified that the similarities in the testing from the bucket-style hat could in fact not be a match to Eric Thompson at all. With the gaps in the footage of the Silverado and the weakness of the DNA testing, Eric's attorney was able to argue that the state had failed to place him at the crime scene. Furthermore, investigators needed to make multiple adjustments to the timestamps recorded on the various security cameras collected from businesses across Waipahu to align to real time. This was necessary to piece together the movements of the Silverado and link that vehicle to the unknown man. That process proved complicated. Upon Eric's arrest, the evidence stated that the man in the bucket hat, believed to be Eric, entered the clinic at about 6.16 p.m. and remained there for 48 seconds, during which time John was struck with four gunshots to the head. But the same arrest affidavit states that John's phone was then unlocked at 6.18 p.m. two minutes later. Aspects of the timeline were not exactly lining up. How can he be here by the door there, walking along by the stepping stones, okay, there, in a truck, all in roughly the same time period. They needed to come up here and explain it all to you. They have not done so. The cell phone data also showed that John's game of Pokemon Go appeared to be active for hours after the time of death theorized by the state. They posited that the application closed when the phone ran out of battery. But if it was instead turned off, then John must have still been alive after 8 p.m. That it got turned off. It's possible. What do you mean it's possible? Why, why is it not possible? I just said it's possible. Joyce Thompson, protected by spousal privilege, did not testify. While the defense spoke about what they called John Tokuhara's secret life, prosecutors spoke about Eric's deceitfulness and lies. He was dishonest about the status of his relationship and he was dishonest about his whereabouts on January 12th, 2022. Because the truth is, is that he still harbored ill intent towards John Tokuhara. The jury deliberated for three full days, after which they returned deadlocked. Judge Paul Wong declared a mistrial. Nine jurors had voted guilty. Three believed that he should be acquitted. I feel like a lot of it was, um, I guess, I suppose, not concrete evidence. And they wanted that concrete evidence, something tangible. It was hard, really hard to get everybody on board for uh, one, one decision. I think the biggest lesson from this is that first impressions by the media, in the media, uh, especially with prosecution press releases, do not tell the whole story. In this case, the jury was able to see what actually happened and the real story, and we're going to we look forward to presenting that again in a second trial. There's just always going to be um, bumps along the road, and um, but we're expecting in the next trial to uh, see what 
uh, evidence comes out, and I think we'll have a better result next time. A second trial was initially scheduled for October 2023, though it never took place. At the time of publication, there is no available date for retrial. That was the case of John Tokuhara and Eric and Joyce Thompson. Thank you once again for joining me, and a special thanks to True Crime with Stephanie Michelle for joining our Members Lounge. I'm going to make sure to go and check out your channel later tonight. For now, I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one. Yeah, the content that you need, this could be a new sign. We talk in the comments, they jot in.